So if you will be opening your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, and we'll be, reading, we'll be examining that passage in a bit. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. For the past couple of weeks, uh, we've been talking about apologetics week. Uh, every fourth Sunday, we talk about defending our faith as Christians. And we have to defend our faith against false systems, false doctrines. And these are one of those systems of doctrines that we know is prevalent here in Korea. And we call it Calvinism. And it's very, very dangerous. It it really does, it's very deceptive. And it's very important as Christians for us to give an answer for the reason of hope within us with meekness and fear. To show show and expose this system for what it really is. And so, once again, for those who are new, for our visitors, I want to uh, talk about what is this system. Let's summarize what this system is all about. And then two, we're going to, of course, look at what do Calvinists use for proving their doctrine. And then third, we're going to look at points of truth about the atonement. And then we're going to look at some, of course, perilous consequences if this doctrine is taught. So remember that this is built upon five main things. Uh, But it's also undergirded, of course, by the foundation of a misconstrued view of God's sovereignty. But we can make this tulip, we can look at each petal and show that it falls down. We already looked at, of course, uh, total depravity, and we saw that they have this misconstrued view of God's sovereignty in that when the, in the beginning of creation, when Adam and Eve sinned, we agree that Adam and Eve sinned, no doubts about that. But did their sin pass on? Was it inherited by every human being? Because we all came from Adam and Eve. um, And of course, they call this original sin. And they say this sinful nature was passed on. Well, as you can see, the Bible just does not teach that sin is inherited. We saw this from Ezekiel 18. But this is what they teach. They teach that we're totally depraved that you can do nothing in of yourself to choose to obey God. Then, of course, this leads to uh, that God has already prepared heaven for those who, whom He's going to choose without any choice on their part, and He's going to choose to send those to hell without any choice on their part. Now, that's just that, that's what they teach. And, of course, we see that this is based on nothing on the part of man. But as we saw in previous lessons, we do have the ability to choose to obey God. And then we're studying today, which I think is the weakest chain in this system of doctrine. And that is called limited atonement. You see, they say, well, since God's salvation is only for those who are chosen, then Christ died only for those who are chosen. So that's why it's limited And therefore, God is going to help those who are totally depraved, those who are predestined for salvation. God's going to intervene directly through the Holy Spirit. That's why they call it irresistible grace. And then, of course, God's going to keep them saved to the very end. So that's called perseverance of the saints. So we'll talk about those in future lessons. But let's talk about this limited atonement concept. Let's talk about this a little bit deeper. So the two questions I want to ask is, is it limited? Is it only for those who would be saved? Or did Christ die for everyone and everyone has a choice to choose whether they want to have access to God's benefits, to God's grace? What does the Bible teach? Number two, is there an atonement? And on this, we actually agree with Calvinists that there is an atonement. Christ sacrificed. Christ did die for the sins. But whose sins did he die for? Romans 5.11 says, And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
through whom we have now received, New King James says, reconciliation, King James says, atonement. So as you can see, there is atonement in the Bible. So like we said, Calvinists would not say, well, God would not waste the blood of Christ on those whom he did not predestine. So that's why they say that only Christ's sacrifice is only for a select few. Okay? Now, here's what certain Calvinists say, and I'm just going to read part of it. So Christ's redeeming work was intended to save the, the elect or the chosen only and actually secured salvation for them. His death was a substitutionary sacrifice of the penalty of sin in the place of certain specified sinners. Now, as we can see, is this what the Bible says? That's what we want to look at. We're going to look at what the Bible says about the proof text of what these Calvinists use. So the first one they use is John 10. Now this is the great discourse Jesus gives about him being the good shepherd. Now let's read what it says. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. I want you to notice here the contrast between what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look at the Pharisees, look at the Sadducees, look at the Jewish leadership at this time. They are corrupt, they're evil, they're hypocrites. They are not good shepherds, they are bad shepherds. They are leading people astray. On the other hand, there's Jesus, the perfect example, the good shepherd who does feed the flock spiritually, who is able to give salvation to his to the to people. And so, what does Jesus mean when he says he gives his life for the sheep? Does this, as the Calvinist presumes, that this is only for those who are chosen for salvation? What does he mean by this? So that's what their first argument is. And it is true that the church is known and called by the flock of God. For instance, if we went to 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, the Bible says, The elders who are among you I exhort, I am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also partaker of the glory that will be, will be revealed. Shepherd... The flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those who are entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will see the crown of glory that does not fade away. So no doubt the church is the flock of God and that elders are appointed to be those shepherds, to be the pastors of the flock. Well, so did Christ die for only the church? Well, let's read what else Jesus says here. He says, And other sheep, in that red part, I have which are not of this fold. Well, that's interesting. Now, what is Jesus referring to? He's referring to the Gentiles. There will be Gentiles who choose to obey God. They're going to obey the gospel, and they can be a part of God's fold. And them I also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. See, Jesus brings them because they choose to obey God's voice. Now, I want you to see how it is the case that all of us have sinned, like the Apostle Paul talks about. All of us have gone away and been astray like sheep. And Jesus is that good shepherd, and he wants you. He wants you to be a part of the flock of God, to be a part of his church. But it's your choice whether or not you want to follow it or not. So 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 is definitely where there were some Corinthians who were people who lived in sin, who were not of God's fold, 
And they chose to obey the gospel. And look, they, were, they became a part of the church. So it says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Yes, Paul, you're right. The unrighteous will not go to heaven. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. They chose to become a part of God's flock. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And so the Corinthians were once on their way to hell. But they chose to obey God. And now they were on, they're on their way to the kingdom of heaven, to that he- everlasting city of God. So that's something we need to recognize there. Now, Acts 20, verse 28. Here's another proof text verse that is used. Paul has gone to uh, Miletus and he calls for the elders, the pastors of the church from, uh, from Ephesus, and he has this meeting with them. And this is what he says to them. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So see... Christ did purchase the church with his own blood. It is the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins. It is the blood of Jesus that can grant us salvation. Now, does this mean that Christ died only for the church, though? Well, we're gonna, we'll look at that in just a moment. Another verse they use is Ephesians 5, 25-27. This is why I'm going to bring these together. And Paul is talking about the marriage relationship, but he talks about Christ as the head and the body is the church. And he relates that, of course, to the husband and the wife. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So no doubt, Christ did sacrifice himself for the church. question is, did he die for the church only? That's the question. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So you take both of these verses together in Acts and in Ephesians, and did Christ die only for the church? Was his sacrifice only for the church? Well, we do know the church is composed of those who are saved, and Christ did purchase his church with his own blood. But here's the thing. I want you to look at me in the book of Revelation for a moment. The book of Revelation is a great book about God's victory over his enemies. And in a sense, Revelation 21 and 22 is in an already not yet state. You see, we have become, in a sense, a part of those who are in the church. We are part of this new Jerusalem. In Hebrews it says, you have come to the new Jerusalem. But we're still awaiting the city which is to come, that everlasting city. And so here it's really interesting that uh, the writer John says, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the bride. Who's the bride? The bride is the Lamb's wife. And you know what the Lamb's wife says? Come. The invitation is open to everyone. Wait, I thought the invitation is only for the church, only for those who are saved. No, it's for everyone. The invitation is open to everyone who wants to obey the gospel to truly have the benefits of the blood of Christ that can save them from their sins. So that's why it says, Let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. So as you can see, Christ's sacrifice is not just for those who are saved, But the benefits can be accessed by those who are outside the church if they will obey the gospel. Well, the third argument that Calvinists usually turn to, and this is one of the main passages of Scripture, and you have to read Romans 9 in its context. But they say that the love of God in giving Jesus as a sacrifice was this not general kindness to all of creation. I mean, read what, the, what one person says. John Gill says, It is a special 
and discriminating love the favor which he bears to his own people as distinct from others. And one of their main verses they use for this is Romans 9.13. Now, we'll come, back, we'll come back to Romans 9.13. But I want you to read with me through this context, and you will understand it. So, remember, Paul talks about in Romans, the Jews sinned, the Gentiles sinned, everyone has sinned. But you know what? If you will have faith in Jesus Christ and obey the gospel you can have access to salvation. Salvation is for everyone. Now, Paul starts to talk about some questions that people give. Like, well, okay, Paul, what about the nation of Israel? What did they have to do with God's plan? I mean, has God rejected Israel? So how does Israel fit into God's plan? Well, let's read what he says. I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have a great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. I want to stop right there. Notice the conviction Paul has toward those who are of his nationality. He loves his countrymen so much He would even trade places with them if he could. That's how much he loves those who are lost. And I want to ask us, do we have that type of love for those who are lost that we're trying to reach for Christ? Do we have that kind of love to reach out? Just keep that in your mind as we read this. So he says, who are Israelites, to whom pertains the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. I mean, wow, look at all the blessings the Israelite nation had. Man, they had it all. Of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. Now notice this, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Notice how Paul is distinguishing between two Israels. You are either part of the true spiritual Israel, Jesus Christ, or you are part of fleshly Israel. Those who are fleshly is, uh, in the fleshly nation of Israel, they're lost in sin. And they need to obey the gospel so that they can become a part of the true Israel. All right, so he says, <clears throat> uh, For though they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls, it was said to her, The older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, But Esau I have hated. So you see how the Calvinists are using this verse in bold? And they're saying, see, God has this special discriminating love. Now, how should we understand this passage? It's actually very simple. Let me just explain it. You see, you have to distinguish between chosen for salvation and chosen for service. Paul is talking about being chosen for service in part of this, a part of these verses. So you will remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, Isaac had two sons, we know, Jacob and Esau. Now, it's God, he has the choice to choose through which nation he, wish, he wishes to work out his plan of redemption. 
Well, God did choose Jacob. So through Jacob, of course, came the nation of Israel. But see, along, he did not choose Esau. You remember Esau would bring forth the Edomites. But it was God worked through Israel to bring forth the Messiah. So God chose Jacob for service, chose Israel for service. Now, in Israel, you become either part of two groups. And this is what was starting to happen. You either cling to your physical descent and say, oh, look who I came from. No, it's not about physical birth. It's about a spiritual birth. You have to have a heart of contriteness and repentance and obedience unto God. So those are who become the spiritual sons of God, spiritual children. They are counted as God's spiritual seed. And if you believe and obey Christ, the Messiah, you become a part of the of those who are saved. That's all that Paul is talking about here. It's not difficult to understand. And so we have to realize here that, uh, let me just read this. Romans 9, 13 is simply showing the righteousness of God. That God chose Jacob for service, to work through him. Because he was the ancestor of the Messiah. But this is not talking about salvation. God allows the gospel to be presented to everyone, but everyone has that choice to choose whether or not they want to be a part of God's chosen. So now that we've talked about these proof texts, I want to look at some points of truth about what God says about the atonement. And I know that these are very simple, but they need to be restated again. The gospel is for everyone. That's one of the songs we sing in our psalm book. The gospel is for all. And Mark 16, 15 and 16, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So the gospel is for everyone. Jesus died for everyone. Jesus died for all people. Look at these verses. Luke 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. John 12, 32, and if Jesus says, and if I, and if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This, he said, signifying by what death he would die. Romans 5, verse 18, therefore, as through one man's offense, through Adam, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Because why? Because Paul had said earlier, he said, all have sinned because all chose to sin, just like Adam did. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. You see, Jesus died for all men, and you can choose to obey the gospel and partake of those blessings. Look at some other verses. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, Jesus died for all. How can we take that in any other way? Then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. 1 Timothy 2, 5, 6, For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. 1 Timothy 4, verse 10, I don't see how you could take this any other way. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of only a few. No, He's the Savior of all men. He can become your Savior, especially of those who believe, of course. So, how do you... I mean, these passages are so simple to understand, aren't they? How can we take them in any other way? Hebrews 2.9 but we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. So the gospel is for everyone. Jesus died for us all. But also Jesus is able to freely forgive us of our sins. No matter what you've done in your life, Jesus is able to forgive you. 
I want you to read 1 John 2, 1 and 2, which we read. Christ died not for our sins only, but He died for the whole world. I mean, I think it's so great and awesome that our great God who loves us so much, He's willing to forgive us of our sins when we obey Him in in the Gospel. But even after we become Christians, we're going to sin. And then He still, he, He offers His grace and His compassion and His kindness to us. Even though we don't deserve it. And we can be freely forgiven of our sins in repentance and confession. John 1.29, that John, when he saw Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the, whole, of the world. So you see what God is able to do through Christ. Fourth point of truth is that this is the sad part. That there are those who have obeyed the gospel who will sadly turn away from Christ. I can't stress that enough because the religious world around us says, oh, a true child of God can't be ever be lost again. Well, we'll of course, we'll talk about this in upcoming lessons, but look at 1 Corinthians 8 where Paul is talking about this eating uh, meat that was, that was uh, for worship to idols. He says that if the conscience of this weak brother is offended, then look what he says, because of your knowledge... Shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? Think about that. This person who's a strong brother causes this person to sin. Now that's something that we need to think about. It also is said it again in Romans 14. It's kind of the same context. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Look at 2 Peter 2, 1 and 2. You, I don't see how anyone can get, across, get around this passage. But there were also false prophets among the people, as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. Bought them how? Purchased them. With his own blood, but they turned away. And now they've lost access to the benefits of the blood of Christ. Now, you remember how we were talking about all these proof texts that Calvinism Calvinists use? They taught, you know, they use passages from Ephesians like Christ died for the church, or Christ purchased the church with his own blood. Here's what you have to remember the principle to learn how to interpret the Bible. You have to take all of Scripture. And that's what you have to do here. So you, you need to take every single point of truth from every passage. So I want to give you an illustration. Let's just talk about what's going to happen at the end of time. There's going to be a general resurrection of the righteous and the wicked. I mean, if you look at Daniel 12, verse 2... You look at uh, Acts 24 and other passages, there's no doubt that it says that the righteous and the unrighteous are going to be raised. Now, I want you to look at with me 1 Corinthians 15. If you read that context very, very carefully, you'll see that Paul is talking about the righteous being raised. He doesn't deal with, in that context, about what will happen to the wicked. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he talks about the resurrection of the righteous. Does that that mean that the wicked will not be raised? (laughs) Of course not. They are going to be raised. In fact, Paul says that the dead in Christ will rise first. And then, you can, of course, imply from that afterward, everyone is those who are wicked will be raised. So what what am I trying to say here? You take a universal principle, the resurrection of the righteous and the wicked. Some passages are talking about the righteous. But don't uh, don't, uh, go to this uh, idea, well, okay, the wicked are not going to be resurrected. That's not true. They are going to be resurrected. So what I'm trying to say here is apply that to Christ's sacrifice for everyone. Yes, some passages talk about Christ dying for the church. 
No doubts about that. But it also says in other passages that Christ died for all. So you have to take everything. We just have to realize that those who are Christians have gained the blessings of the blood of Christ. Now, I want you to think about these consequences with me. Why is this doctrine so dangerous? Well, number one, the reason why this doctrine is so dangerous is because it makes God a respecter of persons. Just like we talked about with this unconditional election. I mean, when Paul, when Peter talks to Cornelius, he says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever, whoever what, is qualified by fears God and works righteousness, is accepted by Him. Secondly, I want you to realize that if this Calvinism is true, it's going to discourage people. It really will. Because you will think, oh, I'm not part of the chosen. I'm not part of the ones for whom Christ died. Therefore, Christ didn't die for me, and I'm going to be in my sins, and I'm going to be lost in hell. That would be greatly discouraging, would it not? Certainly. And so when we think that Christ did not die for that person. But I love 2 Peter 3, verse 9. Why is God awaiting this day of judgment? Why is God continually awaiting uh, this day for which He will judge the world in righteousness? Because He's giving us the time and opportunity now to obey. God wants you to repent. He wants you to obey the truth. And He's giving you that time even now. Third, I think it mocks God's... I mean, it mocks man's free will. It mocks your choice. Think about it. You, God, God died for you, and now you can choose to accept or reject Him. And that's why I think when you think about Jesus and what He did for on that cross, and every time we partake of the Lord's Supper and we think about Jesus and what He did for us, man, it should once again produce in us a heart that says, God, I can never thank You enough for what You did. And it's a heart of thankfulness and gratitude. So, when Christ is lifted up from the earth, those who have a contract heart, they will be drawn to the Savior because of the Savior's love for them. Remember what Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus wants you to come. He wants you to accept His invitation. You know, I want to end on the famous song that we always have sang as children, but even when we sing it now, because when you think about it, this this doctrine, <laughs> you know, the song wouldn't make sense to some of us because we're not part of the elect. But Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You know what the Bible tells me? Jesus died for everyone. He died for you. He died for me. And so, will you respond to Him in faith and love and obedience. Maybe you uh, don't realize what you need to do be- to become a Christian, to, to be saved by Christ. Let me show you what the Bible says. The Bible says it very simply. The Bible says to believe on Him. But the religious world out there, they've twisted this and said, oh, it's belief only. No, it's not belief only. It's talking about belief will lead you to obedience. Belief and obedience always go together. And so Jesus says to repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, live for Him the rest of your life, and to be baptized. That's where Jesus will wash away your sins, just like He washed away the sins of those Corinthians. Will you respond to Him? While together we stand and sing the song of encouragement.